Hey, welcome back. Thanks for sticking with us all day. And we're going to get to the part of C++ that people are scared of. And usually, if you told someone else you're going to learn C++ today, they'd go, oh, yeah, hmm, pointers. And uh, here we are. We, we waited a while for pointers. We're going to do pointers in Module 5. We did const all the way back at the very beginning. Pointers, now that you know references, they're not scary. They're really not. It's a little extra punctuation, a little extra syntax that you didn't meet before. But they're really not fundamentally different from references, with a few small exceptions that I'll show you. We're also going to talk to you about this weirdly named resource acquisition is initialization. Because it solves a problem that, again, people who don't like C++ will tell you, oh, you're responsible for cleaning up after yourself, and it sucks. And you know, I used to say, people who uh, want garbage collection believe that memory management is too important to be done by the programmer, and people who don't want uh, memory uh, garbage collection believe memory management is too important to be done by a tool. We all think it's important. Um, I don't like the way we used to do it now that I know how we do it now. And uh, you don't have to do it all yourself. Uh, that's the whole point of this module, to show you that it's not uh, actually scary at all if you do it the modern way. So we'll talk about pointers and uh, about dynamic allocation of memory. This is a, a little bit of a sea change from what you've seen in the little sample uh, functions and demonstrations so far. So we'll explain why you might want dynamic allocation and what some of the consequences are. And then we have to talk about something called exceptions. Now, we can't do all the glorious detail that is exceptions, but you just need to know what they are and what they might do to your program uh, if you were to rely on them, which you do have to do in certain cases. We touched a little bit about copying and assignment and things leaving their scope and their lifetime ending. We need to revisit that in the context of objects. And things will get briefly really complicated and horrible. And uh, just stay with me, because I'm going to take you out the other side of that into not complicated and not horrible uh, with RAII. And then we'll also talk about smart pointers. So let's start with pointers. You saw this earlier. If I make myself a couple of integers in local scope inside this function f, somebody, the compiler, the computer, the system, you don't need to really worry who the somebody is, sets aside some memory and puts x in some of those bytes and y in some of those bytes. And whenever I need to talk to x or y to get their values, set their values, print them, whatever, something under the covers ends up touching those pieces of memory. You also saw that you could have references so that you had other names for that same piece of memory in the same scope or in a different scope, like when you pass something into a function by reference. So all pointers is is another yet another name for those pieces of memory. I can make a pointer, pay no attention to what it says in the arrow for a moment, represented by the blue arrow that points to the beginning of x. And I can make a pointer represented by the orange arrow that points to the beginning of y. Now the syntax for that is to use the ampersand operator. And you can be forgiven for saying, wait, so ampersand after a type means it's a reference, but ampersand before an actual variable means the address of the variable? Yes, yes it does, and it wasn't my choice, and so nobody checked with me. So. There are only so many keys on the keyboard. Exactly. We really, we really are stretching the punctuation capabilities of the C++ language already at this point. So ampersand x means the address of x, a pointer that points to the place where x starts. And ampersand y means the address of y, a pointer that points to the place where y starts. Why do I want yet another way to use another name for the same thing? Well, I can put that into a variable and then use that variable, maybe pass it to a function or uh, keep it and uh, have access to it later. So the syntax, the punctuation here is int star. That means that it is an integer pointer. And both pointer to x and pointer to y are of type integer pointer. One's pointing to x and one to y. Although remember, the compiler does not read and understand these names. We chose these names to make sense to you. You could call them elephant and giraffe if you wanted to. You would just be being mean, but that's okay. One of the things you can do with a pointer when you have it is you can dereference it. That is, you can ask the pointer, tell me what you point to, go there, get that value, and give it to me. And that's what's happening in the last line on this code. I have an integer x, which I will initialize to 1. I have an integer pointer, int star, called pointer to x, which I'll initialize to the address of x. And then I have another integer y, which I will initialize to 
the contents of pointer to x. In other words, follow that pointer, go get the value there, which is 1, and bring it back and copy it into y. It's kind of the long way around, but it lets you see dereferencing, lets you see indirection. Can, don't have to just do it when you're initializing. Here we're going to say, take that pointer to x, dereference it, and put 2 where it points to. So it can go in either direction. You can dereference to get a value or to put a value through a pointer. A reference, remember, had to be initialized and couldn't be changed to refer to something else later. But a pointer can. And this is one of the key differences. The pointers don't have to be initialized, or they can be initialized to the special I don't point to anything value, which I'll show you soon, and you can change what a pointer points to. And this is key to a certain set of idioms within C++ programming. So here we have x and y, and we have an integer pointer called p. We initialize p to the address of x, and then, without doing anything with it because we're trying to fit on a PowerPoint slide, immediately change its value to be the address of y. So that p was pointing to x, and if you'd have said star p equals 3, you'd have changed the value of x. But now p's pointing to y, and if you say star p equals 3, you'll change the value of y. And you can probably imagine some circumstances where that would be really helpful. Say you had a whole pile of thingies, and one of them was the active thingy. You could give somebody a pointer to the active thingy, and they could go dereference the pointer to change the underlying thingy. Technical term, I know. I mentioned there's a special value that means not pointing to anything. This is it. It's pronounced by some people null pointer, but by most people null putter. The reason for the slightly weird punctuation of saying putter rather than pointer is that back in C there was also something called the null space pointer, which was different from null putter. And null putter is the way to say this pointer doesn't point anywhere. Probably this pointer doesn't point anywhere yet. We're going to get it to point to something, probably, but we're going to set it up not uninitialized to random junk or pointing to yesterday's lunch or anything like that, pointing nowhere with this special eye not being used to point somewhere yet value, and later we'll change it to point to where it needs to go. Let's prove some of this in the IDE. All right. So I have here a little demo, um, and I'm actually just going to run it in the debugger, and we're going to step through to take a look at it. So we have an integer x, int x. We initialize it with a value of 1. We can see that here. So we can see that at the moment, pointer to x is not yet initialized. It's just, it has that 0xcc fill value. And we're going to initialize it with uh, the address of x. So another way to think about the address is, if you have, um, if you think of memory as being one giant array, um, the address of a variable, you know, cause, because a variable takes up some bytes in that array, um, is its offset into that array. So if it's, you know, at 4,000 uh, somewhere in memory, then the address would be 4,000. And so the pointer value would be 4,000 for that. So here we can see in the debugger that the pointer value is, you know, this giant number because, you know, we have 32 whole bits of address space. So there's 4 billion bytes in, in our address space. Uh, and the x happens to be here. So now that we have this pointer to x, we can dereference it to initialize y. So we'll see here now that we've dereferenced it, and y has now a value of 1. I'll also note that you can uh, use these operators in the debugger. So for example, um, we can say uh, ampersand x to get the address of x. And we can also say, uh, we can also dereference the pointer to x here in the debugger. And we can uh, see what it, it, it uh, points to. So this is really helpful for all sorts of reasons. You can actually put in almost arbitrary expressions and the debugger will be able to evaluate it, which is uh, quite handy. So now, um, now that we have y and x, we're going to set the value of y to 3. Now note that, again, y is still its own object, so doing that has no effect on the value of x. We can see that x still has a value of 1. But now we can write the number 4 through the pointer to x to change the value of x. So we can see that when we do that, the value of x changes to 4. Similarly here, we're going to show that we can uh, change what a pointer points to. So here we've initialized p, so it currently points to x. You can see that here. Maybe it's better if we show it this way. Oops.
So here you can see that P is the same as the address of X. And now when we step over this next line, P is now equal to the address of Y. So we can change what it points to. And now if we were to um, perform indirection through P, if we were to dereference P, we could change the value of Y through it or read the value of Y through it. So now, and we can do that. We're going to dereference P and we can see J now has the value 3. And now we can set P to point to no object. So we're setting it to this special null pointer value. Now, this next line is very interesting. We're going to try and uh, dereference, get the value pointed to by P. But P doesn't point to any value. It points to nothing. It points to this null putter thing. So when we do this, our application is actually going to crash. And Visual Studio provides this handy uh, error message saying that there was an access violation, reading location, and then all zeros. So if you ever get this, it means that you've dereferenced a null pointer. It means that you've tried to use a null pointer. You've tried either to write to the memory at a null pointer, or you've tried to read from it. Um, and this is a program bug. So Visual Studio doesn't terminate the application. It gives you the opportunity to fix it. But if we weren't running under the debugger, it would have just crashed immediately. Um, so this is, very this is very important that you want to make sure that you never, um, never dereference null pointers. If you ever accept a pointer as a function argument, um, if it might be null, if, if you expect that the user might pass you a null pointer, then you should always make sure to check, is this null before using it? Um, on the other hand, if you accept a pointer parameter and you require a, uh, it to be non-null, so if you tell the, the person calling it, hey, you better pass a non-null pointer, um, then you really don't want to check because then if the user do, or if the caller does pass a null pointer, it's a logic bug. It's a bug in the program. And so the thing that you want it to do is you want it to stop immediately because it gives you, you know exactly when the error happened then. There's no way to paper over it. You know this is, there's, this is where the mistake is. We're going to stop the, uh, the program. So this is, for example, what we do in the, uh, in the C standard library that we ship with Visual Studio is if you pass an invalid parameter, we'll just, stop, we'll just terminate your app by default because it's a potential security issue because it's a logic bug. So you may wonder, we have references and pointers, two different forms of indirection. Why bother? But there's some really important differences. A pointer can be null. And if you try to dereference a null pointer, it's going to blow up. Uh, one way to make sure no one passes you a null pointer is not to take a pointer. If you take a reference, it can't be null. And then you don't have to check and you don't have to blow up. But people in some applications need more flexibility than that. They need to be able to change what it points to or even have it point to nothing. So you use pointers when your application logic needs it. And then you take the consequences having made that choice. Yeah. So one of the distinctions that I like to use in my code is if a function is going to store um, a reference to an object for later use, uh, then it should use a pointer. Uh, because it, it sort of conveys this idea that, hey, I really need to look at this and make sure I understand what that function is going to do. But if it's not, if it's just accepting the reference and it's going to you know, use it, and then when it returns, it won't ever use it again, using a reference is great because it's, it's easier. It has, again, like Kate said, the extra checking that it's not going to, um, you know, there's no possibility for it to be null. There's, um, you know, it, it's, it's much harder to use incorrectly. Um, and so you don't have to think as much when you're calling the function. You can assume, okay, this is going to be, Correct. And there's a little less punctuation, too, when you take a reference. That, too. When we wanted to dereference the pointer, we had to use the star operator to dereference it. But when we wanted to use the reference, we just used it. And so if all else fails, just out of sheer ornery laziness, go with references unless you happen to need pointers. Absolutely. But let me show you a reason why you might want to need pointers. We talked a little bit about um, lifetime and dynamic allocation is a extension of that conversation about lifetime. We've been making objects that live in a scope. We're in some function f. We make a named rectangle called Fred rectangle. It's being initialized. This syntax is going to call the constructor that takes a string and two integers. Great. Rectangle is built. When we hit that close brace, this rectangle goes away. We showed you that first with integers, but it's just as true with objects as with anything else. But what if it wasn't uh, a rectangle? What if it was a, a UI element like a, like a window or an open file or something? One piece of code opens it, but another file, another piece of code still needs to work with it later. We don't want it to go away. We'd like it to have a, a lifetime that's longer than just the scope of this individual function. And C++ provides a capability for this, which we generally call the heap. 
but which has an official name of the free store. And, and James, do you know why it has two names? And I don't. Um, I actually did some research uh, in an attempt to answer a Stack Overflow question on why uh, we call it the heap at all. Because it's not like there's a data structure called the heap, but it's totally unrelated to the, the free store that we call the heap. And uh, I found in, uh, in one of Knuth's books, uh, he just said, yeah, at some point we started calling this thing the heap. So I, I, don't, I think it's lost to the annals lost, of history. Lost yeah, to the mists of time. Well, yeah. uh, so in general, chit chat, talking to each other, we, we don't say the free store. But if you want to look it up like in the spec or in a book, it, then you'll see it called the free store. Free store and the heap are the same thing. And it's a bit like a compost heap or a garbage heap in a sense in that it's a whole separate part of your application that is a different scope from your individual functions. When you create something on the heap, it stays there until you take it off and throw it away. The way to get an object created on the heap is to call something or to use a keyword new. And new will give you back a pointer to a place on the heap where the object has been created for you. Never a reference, always a pointer. When you want to clean it up, you use the keyword delete, and you hand that same pointer to delete, who will then follow the pointer to the heap and do whatever needs to happen to clean up there. So one important reason to use pointers is I'm going to be dynamically allocating things, uh, directly or indirectly, with new and delete. And therefore, I'm going to have to work with pointers because that's what they work with. So here's a quick code sample. Um, I'm going to initialize an integer pointer called p. And what I'm going to initialize it with is what's returned from saying new int braces 1. So this is going to go onto the heap, allocate enough memory for a single integer, put the value 1 into that memory on the heap, and get a pointer to that newly allocated piece of heap memory. And that numerical value of that pointer is what's going to go into p. If on the very next line I dereference that pointer p and say star p equals 2, the memory out on the heap will now have 2 in it. The pointer won't have changed. It'll still be the 10 million and whatever. But the, the value over on the heap will now be different. And presumably, uh, if we're getting into longer than a single slide of code, we do something with that, those values and with that pointer. When we're done, we must clean up after ourselves by saying delete p. Let me get James to show you that. Absolutely. So I have here an example. And this code should look very familiar if you were paying to attention to what Kate just said. <laughs> Uh, because it's the same as what was on the slide. So you can see here we use the new operator to create a new int, and we initialize it with the value 1. And this yields the pointer. So if we look in the locals window, we can see that p is this pointer that was dynamically allocated, which is what we call when we, when we use new. So then we can change the value pointed to by p, and then we can delete p when we're done. Now, it's very important to note that you absolutely must delete p. And if you, so if you don't, it'll, it, basically you leak it, and it ends up sitting around forever until your program exits. Um, as we saw before, uh, objects that you declare like in your function as local variables uh, have automatic lifetime management. So basically, uh, when that close brace uh, that, of the block in which they're declared is reached, the, they go away. They're automatically destroyed by the, their, their lifetime is ended automatically. But with things allocated on the heap, you have to make sure that you destroy them yourself using delete. And you have to make sure that you do so exactly once. So you can't you know, delete p and then delete p again. Um, if you were to do that uh, here with the, we're currently using debug builds, we would actually detect that and we would warn you or we would uh, tell you it's an error. But uh, in general, you don't get an error. It can just lead to just horrible badness. corruption and, and terribleness. So you have to be very careful. Now, that's OK, because we'll see in a little bit that you should actually never write delete in your code. And we'll see how to work around it and how, what the better way to do that is. That's right. I, I did promise you it was going to get better uh, after it got a little bit uh, scary for a moment. So we'll continue on with pretending that you're going to be the one who remembers to call delete. Uh, I wanted to give an example of uh, memory leaks. You know, people claim they have to reboot their machines every once in a while mm -hmm. and that kind of thing. Uh, years and years ago, I knew some folks who had a, a printer server that needed to be rebooted every two weeks. Unless they were having a very busy and difficult week, and then it had to be rebooted every week. <laughs> and uh, it turns out that there was less memory on machines in those days. This thing leaked eight bytes of memory every time it printed a job. And when it printed enough jobs, there was no more memory, and that's why it hung. So uh, memory leaks are a really serious issue in your code, mm -hmm. and you know, not cleaning up after yourself can lead to instability in the underlying OS and needing to reboot. Yep. So this was um, 
this was actually a much bigger problem back in you know the Windows 95, 98 era, and and those OSs that weren't uh, based on Windows NT like modern Windows OSs. Um, because on those OSs, all of the apps shared a single address space, like they could all overwrite wherever they wanted, and, and if you leaked memory, it was leaked for good uh, in many cases. And so on modern Windows systems, if you, when, you kill your pro, when you kill your app, like all the memory that you were using goes away, even if you had leaked it, because the OS knows exactly what it allocated for you. So it's less of a danger today, but again, you still have the problem in, in if you're running a service in the background and it needs to run for a long time, leaking memory is a big issue. Um, memory is actually, I think, the least of your concerns because uh, you know there are things like file handles. Like if you open a file and you forget to close it, you're going to have yeah. You know, now major no one else issues. can touch that file until yep. you close it. So, Absolutely. but we'll take a look in a few minutes about how, uh, how the best way to solve this is. Yeah, so. resources in resources in general. If life was as simple as the apps you've seen so far, we'd have nothing to worry about. I mean, for one thing, they don't do anything. They're like, well, I'm going to create this memory on the heap, and then I'm going to turn around and clean it up. Woo! I didn't really have to remember for very long that this uh, task was waiting for me. But, you know, in real life, we were creating those things on the heap because we wanted them to have a really long lifetime, that maybe one object was going to open the file, and a half an hour later, a different object would finally close the file. So there you have to have more of a uh, confidence about the flow of what's going to happen in your application. And that confidence can be broken up by something called exceptions. Most of the time, your code should check for errors. The days are long gone when we would say, type the name of the file you want to open, and a human would try to type, you know, notes.txt, and then would make a spelling mistake, and they'd type notes.tot, which doesn't exist, and then the file can't be opened. We tend to give people lists and ask them to choose something from it. But things can still go really weird. Like, I can give you a dialog, and you can choose what file you want to open, and then by the time the code tries to open it, some other process may have deleted the file. Or I can ask you where, what you'd like to do, and you can tell me, and then it turns out the operating system won't let you because you don't have the permission to do that. So while it's best to check in advance, there are times when you just cannot. And as you saw way back in the functions module, if I call a function, I don't need to check its return value if I don't want to. I can just completely ignore it and just not even put it into a local variable, or I can put it in a local variable, but not bother saying, well, if that was an error condition, then tell the user something went wrong. And so applications can sometimes find themselves just in a whole heap of trouble. And they need to put up kind of a bat signal that says, I, I don't belong here. This is, this is really, really bad right here. And that mechanism in C++ is called exceptions. You can't ignore it. Uh, when code throws an exception, instead of the next statement executing, we transfer all the way back to any place that said that it can handle it if exceptions are thrown, which if you uh, never thought that they might happen means right out of your app. Uh, but if you did think that they might happen, it's, you suddenly skip executing many, many lines of code. And the problem with that is that the lines of code you skip executing may be the cleanup that you really needed to do. So here's the syntax, and then we'll give you a demo. You start with the keyword try. And you're not allowed to have a variable called try. It's a C++ keyword. Then you have braces, like always, to say, this is what I'm going to try to do. And the way to read it is just that. I'm going to try to do this. And I have reason to believe that it might all go horribly wrong. Then we you know, work, call functions, do calculations, whatever we need to do. If at any point in there, either in the code you see directly in the try block or in code that's called from inside the try block, if an exception gets thrown, we will immediately transfer control to the catch block. You can see here I'm catching an exception. It's a class provided by the standard library. It's in the standard namespace. And I'm catching it by reference to avoid slicing. Uh, there are a number of other classes that inherit from exception. And I don't want to slice off any information that might be in them. And I'm catching it as a const reference because I have no intention of changing it. These habits should be with you no matter what you do. Catching things by reference, catching them by const reference, this is just plain good behavior. And the uh, Exception object has a method what, which gives you back a string, which is what went wrong. And I'm just going to put that on the screen. Your application might do something slightly more interesting. Let's see it happen. All right. Well, I'm going to try and run this demo. Ha, ha, ha. OK. It's time for C++ humor already. Yes, indeed. I've been waiting all day to make that joke. So in here, you can see that we have this try block and we have this catch block. And in here, we also have this throw expression. So what this does is it will throw an exception. 
So we can see we're happily running along and we allocate a P on the heap or a, an integer on the heap and we change it and then we throw an exception. And you can see that control did not pass to this delete. So this delete, we completely skipped over it. That P is still there in memory, it's still taking up space. And the worst part of this is, is we no longer have any way to get access to that object because as you can see, the only pointer that we had to it was here in the try block. And there's no, like, we can't access, it's no longer in scope. So we've completely lost access to this object and we've leaked it. So that is generally bad. That's why we need to be very careful with this. Um, and we can see here in the window that we caught the exception and we printed out trouble. So as Kate said, it's very important to catch by const reference and throw by value. So this is throwing by value. So you never want to, like sometimes I, I see people who new. write throw, let's yeah. throw a new exception and you, you don't want to, you don't want to do that. No. Um, so so th that's the problem in a nutshell, that uh, we skip the delete. And in a world where there are exceptions, uh, managing memory yourself, remembering to call delete when you're done with things that you created with new, it, it just doesn't work. It's just too hard because you really can't be sure when things are going to happen. And there is a way around this, right? I could, I could initialize p to null pointer, and then in the catch block, I could say something like, oh, if p is not null pointer, then delete because I need to clean it up. But now my catch block is uh, kind of filling up with cleanup. Don't do that. Do yeah, not do it's that. a bad thing. You don't want to do that. And we're going to show you a better way to do it. In order to get there, we need to have a bigger conversation about object lifetime. So we want to talk about what happens when you copy objects around, what happens when you assign one object to another, and what does it mean when an object goes away or ceases to exist. We saw this first with integers. When I initialize y using the value of x, y didn't exist before this line, had no meaningful values. Now the values from x get copied into it. Whereas with assignment, y has a value, and I'm landing on that with a new one from x, and that's assignment. The exact same thing can be done with rectangles or any class user-defined type, whether it's the ones in the standard library like string or your own like rectangle. So here x is a rectangle, 3 by 4 rectangle, and y is an entirely different rectangle that I happen to choose to initialize by copying the values of x into it. In the next line I say y equals x, it will actually land on the old values uh, with the values from x. So that's uh, assigning the individual elements from x onto y. That's what the compiler just does for you. I mean, I've shown you rectangle. You've not seen anything about here's how to do assignment, here's how to do copying. But this being C++, uh, we're in charge. And if we want to, we can tell the compiler how to do these things. When you copy an object that's an instance of a class, we say that we run the copy constructor. And one will be generated for you if you don't define one. The compiler will make you one. But you can make your own. And it's in, it looks like this. First of all, like all constructors, its name is the name of the class. So for rectangle, the copy constructor is called rectangle. Now, you know we have overloading. You can have any number of functions called rectangle as long as they take different parameters so that the compiler can tell them apart. You've met one that doesn't take any parameters. That's a default constructor. And one that takes two integers, that uh, it just sticks in width into width and height into height. This one takes a rectangle. But it doesn't just take a solid rectangle object. That would be bad. It takes a rectangle reference and specifically a const rectangle reference. Now you may notice the const has moved a little bit here and just as uh, when we were talking about constant versus int const, the compiler doesn't care if you say const rectangle reference or rectangle const reference. They're both happy to the compiler and you'll see both of them in the wild. So the copy constructor takes a rectangle by reference so there won't be any slicing but promises not to change it. All it's going to do with it is copy its elements into the thing it's constructing. This is a potential implementation of the copy constructor for rectangle. We're just going to take the value that belongs in width and use it, the other rectangle's width for that, and the value that's going to go into height is going to be the other rectangle's height. So this is specifically, um, this is what the compiler will generate. So if you don't define your own, 
uh, the one that the compiler generates looks exactly like this. So it just copies each member individually. And if this was what you intended to write, don't bother writing it. Let the compiler do it. I mean, there's no point in you typing. There's no medals for typing. And the, you open up the opportunity to make errors, like accidentally typing width into height and height into width and that kind of thing. But sometimes you need to do something a little different, especially if pointers are in the game. Now, you may think that uh, equals could do the same thing, create a uh, copy to do the assignment with, but it doesn't. It actually uses an assignment operator. And the name of the function needs to be the equal sign. But that's a really screwy equals sign. It's not really a good function name. So we make it, this is way better, operator equal sign. <laughs> <laughs> but at least we don't look like we just had a stroke while we were typing. So uh, the rectangle operator uh, assignment operator is called operator equals, and it too takes a constant re rectangle reference. But you notice that unlike constructors that don't return anything, the assignment operator returns a rectangle reference. And the default behavior here, as with the copy constructor, is to just copy over each individual element one at a time. Assign. Assign, sorry. Because, because uh, our guys are integers, but they might not be. They might uh, also be instances of classes, and then uh, it, they would be using the assignment operator for those classes, which is not necessarily the same as the copy constructor for those classes. And the return star this, we need to return a rectangle reference for reasons that don't happen so much anymore, but you can type x equals y equals 2. And in order for that to work, a y has to return the right thing. Anyway we have the obligation to return a rectangle reference and you sort of look around and say, do I have any rectangle? Oh, the this pointer. Remember the this pointer from a couple of modules ago? And since it's a pointer, I can dereference it with star. And that's why this guy does a return star this. It's basically one of those things that is just there for legacy reasons. Like it, exactly. was, it was this way in C that you could assign multiple things in one, uh, one statement. And so now... It has to be there. Now it, we do it because we do. Yeah. That's right. So it's, it's just a requirement, and it's uh, at this point almost uh, just a, a ritual, a ceremony. So you saw this slide before. We, these are just integers. X comes into existence when we hit the line that declares it, and Y comes into existence on the next line, and then when we hit the close brace, they go out of existence in the opposite order. When they're integers, Nothing much happens when they come into existence and go out of existence other than the person who's responsible for handing out memory keeps track of where there's memory available to be handed out. But when they are objects, instances of user-defined types, then something interesting happens. A function called the destructor runs. Now the destructor name is always a tilde, and those of you who aren't sure where the tilde is on your uh, keyboard, look up by your escape in the sort of top left, and it's probably a capital backtick or something. Uh, tilde plus the name of the class. In some uh, logic languages, I believe that symbol means not or opposite yeah. of. And so that's what they were trying to convey, the opposite of a constructor. And the destructor for rectangles called tilde rectangle. It doesn't take any parameters. It doesn't return anything. And this is where you can clean up. We talked about what if you opened a file? What if you... Uh, made a database connection? What if you consumed any real resource on the system? The destructor is a great place to let go of that res resource. Now, why did we come wandering around over this? Well, because it turns out that when exceptions are thrown and execution leaves scope, everything that was created in that scope and that goes out of existence, its destructor runs. And that turns out to be a great hook for us to make life simple. All right. Make life simple, James. Yeah, I'm going to try. So <laughs> it's going to get a little more complex, sort of. So I have here an example. We have this class called Squawker, which I think is a great name. It's Kate's name for the class. So what this class does, it has a default constructor. And the default constructor um, just says that it's default constructing the object. It has another constructor that takes a string, a name, and it prints out, oh, I'm constructing the object name x, whatever name we provide. And it stores it so that when its destructor runs, it can say, hey, I'm, uh, I'm destructing the object named whatever, we, whatever name we gave it. So this will allow us to see when the constructors and destructors run by looking at the program output. So we're going to start off in this main function. Is this OK? If you comment, I'd allocate. Yes. Yeah. So 
I'm going to run the program. And we step over the initialization of this first object, and we see that it's default constructing the object that has no name. And we step over the next one, and we'll see that it's constructed Kate. So then we're going to step over the return, which means that we're going to exit this function. And we're going to see that we destroyed Kate. So Kate went out of scope, and we destroyed um, the, uh, the no-name object that we had there as well. So now, we're going to show another example involving exceptions. So in here, we have this try block. This is similar to what we had before, but we construct a local variable named inner, so it has automatic storage duration. It's going to go out of scope here at this angle bracket, and it's going to be destroyed then. So we construct this, and we can see in the output that we've constructed the inner one. Then we dynamically allocate an object. So we go and we say new, let's go create this one on the heap and get a pointer back to it. And we can see here that yes, indeed, we constructed this heap object. And then we're going to throw this exception named trouble. So what happens when we do that is the destructor for this inner object runs. Because as we said, it doesn't matter how control leaves that, that try block there. It doesn't matter how control passes over this, this brace. No matter what happens, we will always call those destructors in reverse order. But because the local variable ps, it's, it's a pointer. It doesn't have a destructor. It's just a, it's a fundamental type. Um, it has no destructor to be called. So it doesn't get, the object that it points to is not cleaned up because it doesn't know it, it needs to do any cleanup. And since this delete isn't run, we've leaked this squawker object and the string that it contains in it on all of, all of its state. So that's a general example of, of what happens and so we can take advantage of this, and if we never say new here, right, if we can avoid saying new explicitly and having raw pointers like this that own an object, um, and we can always use objects that have destructors, then we can ensure that everything always gets cleaned up no matter what happens. Like if we throw an exception here, if we just call return for whatever reason, then you're guaranteed that you'll never, you'll never leak any resources. And so this is what's called uh, re resource acquisition is initialization, or RAII. It has some, some of us really want to put other names to it. I like scope bound resource management because we're binding uh, the management of resources to this scope. When the owning variable inner goes out of scope, then it gets destroyed uh, and it cleans up all the resources. But you know, RAII is just such RAI a popular its name. name. It, it's hard to. I, it's I hard actually to get like it the other that. way around. Initialization is resource acquisition, is I think what it should be called. Because that, when we, you know, we create that squawker object, uh, we take responsibility for the resources in it, and it doesn't have any because it's not a real object. But imagine that it opened a file or something. We take responsibility for that, and then the destructor cleans up, and that's really the key to the whole thing. And uh, the, you know, when you can create just local objects and don't call new at all, you have a happier life. Now, as we said, sometimes you want a longer lifetime and sometimes you do want to call new. I think you have a, is that the next demo or? Yes, so we have another example for that. Um, but just think that the rule, the number one rule you should come away with from here is that you should never say delete like in, in normal code flow. You should never say close file in normal control flow or close registry key or close network socket or anything like that. Any, any kind of closing you do should be in a destructor. And that way, you can take these destructors and you can, um, um, or these types that have destructors, and use them to control the, the lifetime of things. Um, so the advantage of this over even, say, garbage collection, is that garbage collection works only for memory. And if you want to, you know, have automatic management of other things like file handles or other things, you need some other way to do that. Like most general-purpose garbage collection systems don't have a way to to manage these resources deterministically. So I'm going to go to the next demo which I don't believe this is the demo. Ah, this is the demo. OK. One moment, please. So what we've done here is instead of using a squawker star, just a, which we'd call a raw pointer, or I would like to call a dumb pointer, uh, because it has no logic to it. It's just naked it's, pointer. A naked pointer also uh, is is appropriate. So we've replaced this with what's called a unique putter. 
And what a unique putter is, or a unique pointer, as some people might call it, um, is it's a, uh, it's a type, like our squawker, that owns a heap allocated pointer. So it has a destructor, and when its destructor runs, it calls delete on that pointer. And so we'll be able to see that in a moment. So we can step over the construction, and we can see here that um, the inner was constructed, and then the heap. And then when we step through the exception being thrown, we can see that both of them were destroyed. And <laughs> most, most notably here, the heap object was destroyed first because, again, we destroy things in the reverse order in which they were constructed. So here, this heap object was destroyed first, and then the inner object was destroyed after that. So by doing this, by taking advantage of these types, especially unique putter, which can be reused for all sorts of types, like it can... Um, it's not limited to owning heap, heap allocated pointers. You can actually customize its behavior for practically anything. Um, so the advantage of doing this is that you never have to do any cleanup. Like you'll see here, there's no delete. There's no, you know, we, we don't need to do any extra work. Exactly. It allows us to write extremely correct code. And if you're looking in the demo for where's the code for unique pointer, it's not part of our demo. It's part of the standard library. It's just there. And uh, you'll understand the mechanism of how it could point to a type that we invented uh, shortly but these smart pointers really make the difference in terms of resource management. Mm -hmm. So I think there is one more thing I, I do want to note here, is that um, the other advantage of these is that they compose. So for example, if we had, um, if our squawker type had a unique putter member variable, um, then when the, after the squawker destructor runs, um, the destructor for that member variable would also run. So you can have like 20 unique putters in a single class, and then when an instance of that class gets destroyed, all of the destructors for those unique putters get destroyed. So basically you can build whole trees of objects and, and ensure that all your resources are managed correctly. And actually our squawker type has a std string, and std string is actually itself a container. It, it needs to dynamically allocate memory to hold the string, and when it's destroyed it goes and frees it up. So you, you never need to worry about it. Like when you use std string you never say new or delete, or, or you never have to you know, deal with memory management or resizing buffers. It, ha it handles all that in internally. Yeah, and we never really had to think about it. Exactly. And, and that's exactly how it should be. Like calling new yourself and calling delete yourself and thinking about managing that is not right. What you want is to have an object whose destructor knows how to clean itself up. Yep. And yeah, string is a good example of that, and so is unique pointer. Now, uh, you know, again, we gave you a really fake example uh, in this code where we, we create an object on the heap with new and stick it in a unique pointer and then two lines later we're done with it. Uh, in real life these things can stick around a little a little longer and uh, you maybe want to keep it in a member a variable of an object and then dereference that pointer from time to time when you want to do something and that's all fine. Um, let me show you uh, the smart pointers that we have available uh, in the standard library. You've just met unique pointer, he's in the std namespace. There's also a shared pointer. That's if you want to have uh, several places in your code that are all going to use the same pointer and basically uh, as they copy it around um, they're keeping track of how many copies there are uh, using this memory on the heap. And when the last copy goes out of scope, he sort of says, you know, last one out, turn off the lights. Uh, and if I'm the last one who was caring about this underlying pointer, I will call delete for you. So these are wonderful ways to manage memory without you having to do that work yourself. And we do say now, if you're using new or delete, you're doing it wrong. So you know, 30 minutes ago when it's like you have to remember to call delete, no, no, there might be an exception, uh, we were kind of we're kind of just messing with you. Yeah. So I mean, it is. It's, it's very important to understand how these things work because they're, you know, internally this is what's happening. Um, you know, when you have a string, it's going to go call new underneath the hood to go and allocate memory for something, uh, and then when it's done, it's going to call delete. Uh, but in your code, you should never have to do that. If you say delete more than you know a couple of times, and any of those times are outside of a destructor or something that's you know called by a destructor, then chances are your code could be written in, in a way that makes it much more correct, much easier to verify, much harder to break. Um, yeah, you're just taking on too much work. Yep. So in general, the way RAII works, is why I like to call it initialization is resource acquisition, the constructor acquires some sort of resource. It opens a file, it, it gets a lock, it makes a database connection, whatever it is that it does. This has an immediate benefit, by the way, because you can only initialize the object by calling the constructor, and the constructor is going to open the file, let's say. Your other member functions don't need to go, hey, is the file open? If it's not open, I should open it, blah, blah, because you know the constructor opened it. And then the destructor releases the resource. Even if there are exceptions, the destructor is still going to run. It's going to clean up that resource. We're going to be happy campers.
we already did our smart we pointers. We did our demos. smart pointers demo. We were ahead of we the We were slides. ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Well, I can say my other, you know, I have a series of lines, right? So the compiler is your friend. Yeah. It's your foot. Smart developers use smart pointers. I like that too, yeah. Um, sort of as anecdotal evidence, um, you know, one of people's biggest fears of C++ is, you know, they know of code bases that are that are 20 years old and that use lots of new and delete all over the place and, and, and you know, incorrectly manage resources or, yes. you know, hard to track down memory leaks. Um, and so that's certainly a problem. You know, we have hundreds and hundreds of millions, probably billions of lines of C++ code that was written, you know, before we really learned how to use these techniques, and you may find yourself working on those. Uh, but the goal should always be to gradually pull code forward, to gradually improve things, gradually introduce these, you know, these new modern techniques. Um, I worked on a large 3D simulation code base, and um, we used RAII everywhere for, you know, managing whole complex trees of objects, you know, um, and uh, we... I can count on one hand the number of memory leaks that we had, and they were all because of you know silly programmer errors, and you know were so egregious they were easy to track down. So you know the the days of really complex and horrible object leaks and and memory leaks are are long gone in at least modern code. So if you if you write modern code, if you're I mean, writing modern code, I have exactly. a similar war story where there was a catch block, and you know how we both said don't do that thing, like don't look and see if p needs to be deleted. Well, th yep. this catch block had 200 lines of looking to see if something needed to be not just deleted but closed or released. Right. And uh, we said, let's make the objects that are created inside the scope of the try all have destructors that do their share of this cleanup. The entire catch block actually went away. Mm -hmm. We did not need to, to catch the exception, and there was no cleanup needed to be done at all because we were using RAII. So while the name may leave a lot to be desired, what it does to your apps, it shrinks housekeeping cruft and just leaves behind the work you actually want to do makes your programs easier to read and to test and also easier to write. Yeah, and related to that, um, you know, one of the biggest, uh, I guess, things that clutters code a lot of the time is error uh, error handling. You know, oh, what happens if an error handles in this, or an error gets, you know, raised by this code, or what happens if an error is reported? I have to go and do all this cleanup. Um, in general, most modern C++ never deals with, you know, oh, an error happened. Uh, because we use exceptions, we throw an exception and we let whoever can handle the error handle it. Um, and everything else gets cleaned up automatically because we're using RAII. So we can think about code in the, you know this linear code path. This okay, if everything succeeds, we'll do this, then this, then this, then this, then this. But if any of those operations doesn't succeed, then we'll just unwind everything and and unroll the pieces, and we don't need to worry about that. So it makes th um, you know it's usually very hard to think about those error cases because any operation you know almost any operation could potentially fail all over the place. And so by you know, by using RAI, you can think about the nominal path and know that you've got the error, all the error paths. You, you know, you're not covered. ignoring the errors. They're just going to be handled properly. And yep. yet at the same time, your app's readable because you're not, you know, facing 700 lines of code of which six are really important. And the rest are all about, oh, close this, release that, blah, blah, clean up. What about the other? And you, it's very hard to find the good lines in the middle of all of that. When you really embrace RAI, you make your app so much more readable for that reason. We need to take a break, and you need to take a big breath because we're going to do uh, the standard library next. And uh, your friends are probably really scared of the standard library, and when we've had that hour, you're, you're going to really love it. It's, it's actually going to save you a ton of time. So take a 10-minute break and come back to talk about the standard library with us.